uh, collaboration between the resistance studies in Italy and uh, the Alliance of Critical Education. So I will just say something to begin with about the Resistance Studies Initiative. Um, that uh, it's uh, something that started uh, 2014 in, uh, in UMass from a generous donation from Quakers, um, where we are focusing on understanding resistance between the knowledge of the academics and activists. And one of the things we're doing is these uh, uh, speaker series, and uh, we have two upcoming. Uh, one on uh, the radical candidates for Barbara Deming next week, and then in December by Mandy Carter on how we can build intersectional resistance alliances, collaboration across many different identity groups. So if you want to know more about the, these events and other things we organize, uh, we have a mailing list. So that one is circulating here for people that would like to get our propaganda. Um, and we promise that it will only be about uh, resistance. We, we don't uh, put in other things. Um, so that is one thing, and there is also information over here uh, with um, our unique journal, the Journal of Resistance Studies that we're putting out since 2015, two times a year. The next thematic issue is about digital resistance. Um, and it's, it's a good source for many things, but also for a publication opportunity. Uh, we're looking for more book reviews, so if people are interested in that, uh, you can uh, please feel free to take a free copy. Um, yes, so uh, and, and, and my name is Stella Mintag, and I'm a professor of uh, resistance and uh, sociology. So please, then, Professor Sangeeta, come on. Thank you so much, Stellan, and thank you for um, working um, you know, to make this happen, this event, and to have our um, guest and author here, here with us today. So I'm going to be introducing Dr. Garab Patania, and just also to well, you know, so, um, put into context, the Alliance for Critical Education is uh, an initiative from the College of Education and specific the International Education Program, and it's a faculty and student initiative um, to, to really do these kinds of, again, speaker series, um, book readings, and other kinds of events um, to really foster a, a critical discussion around education and social problems. So in that context, I'm very, very pleased to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Gaurav Patania, who's uh, come to us from Washington, D.C today, um, and this is his, um, this was his dissertation research to all of you doctoral students in the audience, know that this, you know, this is very possible, this, this does happen, uh, that he very quickly, so, you know, his dissertation research on the movement in India, student movement in India, in Hyderabad, um, that he's going to be presenting to us today, um, he was it was something so timely, something so important, a work that, you know, this kind of work that has really not been, you know, been ever done. Um, and this was something that Oxford University really you know, jumped at the opportunity to be able to publish it. So it's really very thrilling to sort of actually have the book in hand because I had met Gaurav when he was sort of actually developing it, you know, as a recent um, PhD and, and a postdoc. Um, also, since his um, PhD in, at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in the Sociology of Education, Garam has been here in the US and he's been both affiliated here at University of Massachusetts with our College of Education. He was here as a visiting scholar. He's also been a visiting scholar, research associate at the University of Southern California. And right now he's teaching in the Department of Sociology at George Washington University. And he's been teaching a course actually uh, to undergraduates in George Washington on social movements. So this is you know, very much sort of his area of work that he's been able to build also then um, also, you know, new syllabi that and opens up sort of this topic for students here in the US. He's also a poet. He does poetry in his spare time, I imagine. And he's, uh, also, you know, he's also won an award for his poet that he writes in Hindi, uh, or also English. And he's currently working on his memoir of growing up in a village in pre-neoliberalism India. Right? 
So without further ado, I want to give the floor to um, Gaurav, and he is going to be speaking to us for about, you know, about 15 minutes, and he has slides. And then it's going to be followed by three of us who are going to be sort of doing a very brief sort of uh, discussion and raising some questions for our um, discussion um, session. And so I want to introduce here is uh, Professor Bamsi Bakularvarnam, who is in the Department of Economics and who is from Hyderabad and again is very familiar with the context that Gaurav did his research in. And I, Stellan is also going to be uh, commenting um, after the presentation and raising a few questions. And I, from the College of Education, um, will also be um, offering a few comments and thoughts. Um, yeah, my name is Sangeeta Gawat, um, and I'm in the International Education Program in the College of Education. So welcome everybody. Um, very happy to see you here on this very rainy afternoon. And I'm going to hand over the floor to... And let me just say that, that there are some snacks here. Feel free to take. Um, um, I've, I've tried to encourage people. But... <laughs> um, yep, right. Yes, yeah. So we're going to move here because we'd like to be able to see the presentation. Thank you, Sangeeta. Thank you, Stalin. And thank you, MC, for coming. And thank you all. Those who are feeling a little crowded in the back, they can come in front. <laughs> so, good. Um, uh, thank you, Sangeeta, for introducing. So this is actually uh, my dissertation work, as she mentioned. Uh, I've been, um, if, because uh, this book came last year, I've been giving, uh, we're talking about the book in different platforms. So recently I had a discussion with uh, a 1968 uh, Columbia University student leader who was heading the free speech movement, um, Mark Rudd, and I invited him to my campus and we had an <coughs> interesting uh, discussion on U.S. and India student politics, like what is going on now. And I got a lot of insights from Mark Rudd because the word he uses nowadays instead of movement, he, he emphasized a lot on the word called organize. He said, uh, he said there is no movement anymore, this is just organizing. He said, I go all over the world, organize people, and kind of, then, you know, we discuss things. He said, that whole generation in 60s, you know, uh, 60s generation of uh, uh, Columbia, Berkeley, Berkeley Revolt, and free speech movement, he said that generation is gone. And uh, now we have to focus on the word organize. And now, of course, when we talk about Columbia Revolt or Berkeley Revolt, we, in that context, I talk about the university as a space like how that generation was able to use that space and uh, all these slogans uh, of that movement, movement where a uh, new wave of student uh, movement was emerging, new left was emerging, which see like the most popular letter he wrote to the students uh, called the new left. And that was the, the era which, which actually started this whole uh, new wave of feminism and uh, LGBT issues, and these are all the issues which uh, are the issues of 60s. So, in that context again, a university kind of becomes a space, a center, it's a kind of breeding ground for all this movement. But when we say knowledge is power in the university space, so but what kind of knowledge and who controls and who has the power? And now, uh, so I'll be focusing on Indian context, but I just, before I jump into my uh, book, I just want to set up the context because you are many PhD students that what actually this higher education space meant for different different social categories. What is going on in, in higher education? Now, knowledge for whom and whose knowledge is being presented. Now, when you talk about the, the university space, now this is one of the uh, latest uh, uh, published by the, uh, the uh, newspaper that how these top Indian Institute of Management and IITs are being represented. And this is, I think, there you can say that how identities are taking form. And what else is happening in a, so 
a large section is not being represented, all these affirmative action policies are not taking place in higher education. And this is the latest uh, recent where actually where I started my book uh, in the introduction, where post rohit Vermula uh, incident uh, worldwide and university is again a site of resistance. And uh, at the same time there is another side which we cannot ignore because uh, what is happening, what is new in the present context is that it is the activists who are taking this dark path of you know, committing suicides. And why I want to emphasize on it, because this is recently that I am um, working on this project and I got to understand that that's what is happening which is nobody is paying attention to. When people are committing suicide, it is not a small number. You you will be surprised by the number, and this is the official data collected by the government. Now imagine if a new if if, if researchers start doing it, so number it, it magnifies. So this is this is a state of India, and the reason is that India is or in government or Indian even uh, the university system they haven't recognized mental health as an issue or as a problem. So you know, there is hardly any study on this. And unfortunately, the, the land of revolutions in India, Maharashtra, is showing the worst uh, numbers uh, in that regard. <coughs> and then, other side, you see that behind this, what is happening, that how these different kind of assertion is taking place, or, or how the discrimination takes place in higher education. Um, and caste is emerging as a major phenomena which is kind of deciding the future of Indian education. And then you also see this kind of, uh, uh, you know, backlash from the administration. So this is what actually I, with, with this I want to start, that, that is what is happening in Indian higher education. And what I focused on in <coughs> my book, it's basically like, I want to show you this, this paper, if you see, I just try to club everything in, in this uh, uh, slide that all you see is the assertion of different kind of identities. You know, you have LGBT, you have the Lives Matter, there is a regional identity, there is an identity based on different cultures. And that is the center point of the book, that how in the scholarship of social movements, the idea of culture, even in the Marxist tradition, has been ignored for a long time. And uh, when I say culture, and then you have issues of identity, issues of language, issues of food, and that we'll also discuss in a coming piece. So, uh, my, I, I did the, uh, the ethnography of uh, India's longest surviving student movement in 2013 to to four, uh, 14, so this was my, uh, the study was conducted around that time, and uh, this is, so I was trying to understand student politics from uh, various nuances of student politics within the university space. So, and this is the first sociological account of Telangana student movement. So now this movement called Telangana movement is this movement for a separate statehood, which has been widely studied. But, the folk, but none of the studies before me have ever talked about the role of students in the politics. But my study tried to uh, establish it as a student, uh, as a student movement because it was started by the students, it was led by the students, and it's the, it was the students who actually sacrificed their lives. <coughs> so in that context, this is also a first ethnographic account of it. Of of a, of a university which has been producing a generation of activists in the past 16 years. Uh, so field work was conducted in this and so I interviewed five generations of activists. So the, the, the first phase of the movement was in 1969 and uh, so the movement started in 60s onwards and that's how you know I divided generation on decade wise. Because generally, what happens in people who come to the higher education, they, they tend to stay longer until their PhDs. So uh, that's how I divided the generation of like five years. But and then there was lull in the in this uh, after 70s, 80s. So 
uh, I use this framework called New Social Movement to understand, and that's again, the framework comes from 1960s uh, uh, scholars who understood uh, news, the emergence of identity-based movement as New Social Movement. So, just want to reflect for those who are interested in this area that how these are the two pioneer scholars who actually in the 60s, first time, started understanding the issues in higher education. And remember now, the issues I showed in the beginning were not issues those days. They were like, you know, the issues were a little different and they tried to highlight these issues. Uh, so these are two American scholars who worked uh, and they established basically uh, the, this new scholarship in higher education. And then the framework when I see new social movement, these are the five scholars whose uh, writings have uh, kind of influenced my thinking while developing or understanding this particular movement as new social movements. So, <coughs> um, and then within that, these are the most recent work uh, on where actually it was the, the, the debate went on into looking at the issues of power and looking at the internal politics, which many scholars call the contentious politics within, within the movement. And uh, so what I want to highlight here is that this role of emotion is a kind of very recent phenomena in, in past 20 years where scholars started talking about the emotion. Because again, uh, we this is a shift from ideology to identity based where the Marxist tradition who has never been focusing on the, these issues of, say, uh, identity issues and the issues of emotions, which are uh, been, which have been neglected in that tradition, and that's why I think this is, in a way, this is a new left or is a new tradition. But uh, these are the prominent issues, I, I guess. <coughs> and uh, these are the most recent work where actually I'm also in touch with these scholars who helped me define my framework for a new social movement. And again, you see here identity and culture are how, how they actually taking shape in this new formation of state where you case a neoliberal or you know, the, the globalized phase of, uh, of the state. And uh, you know, this whole exploring the cultural and political context. And uh, <coughs> this so, in, in other words, this is the debate from ideology to identity, that's what the Western debate has started. And that, this debate will reach to the, to the Indian context in uh, 80s, and, and uh, most of these uh, uh, work has, so now uh, we say what is new in new social movement if you want to try to understand. So, the, the newness is is nothing in that context that you say that this is uh, the uh, in, uh, the way these new social social formation happens. Like for example, just to be very brief, uh, like for example, Arab Spring is the best example of this kind of new social movement where you don't need that kind of uh, ideological leaning. You don't need that kind of groupings. You don't need a, a set of uh, uh, what you call in a movement like the organization, you know, the face to face, which is, you know, which is in the earlier phase where, you know, in Marxist tradition you have uh, that, that the way movement are organized. So, leadership, the, the formation of leadership is different. Now, how would you define the, the leadership in Arab Spring uh, movement? Or, say, even the Me Too movement, these are the new formations. So, this is the newness where you don't need leader where things are online, you know, the virtual world, there is no real world that way. And uh, so this is what is the kind of, just to put it briefly. And so now with that understanding, when Indian scholars started looking at the, this new formation, so this is one of the first work uh, by a professor from Delhi University who uh, understand this Marxist tradition and also kind of take a historical and critical approach look at the Marxian paradigm of modernity and post-modernity in contemporary India. And then there is another uh, pioneer scholar, Professor Ganjam Cha, who has been writing on social movements and he is the uh, another key scholar who highlighted the role of caste identities, re 
regional identities and linguistic identities and uh, kind of make this point that now the debate has shifted. So now you see here the debate which started here in the West in 60s, it took time to reach to India and that's how uh, but again, there are these, these two U.S. scholars who has done pioneer work in understanding caste identity, and they're the first one who highlighted this, uh, the word you see here, Fule Ambedkarite tradition. Uh, these are the local uh, scholar in, in India who actually nowadays, in, uh, uh, they are kind of guiding, they are the ideological base of uh, the present student uh, politics in India. So, now, whenever people talk about student politics in India, so you have to talk about that full and bit right tradition. So this is the framework which was developed by these two U.S. scholars. <clears throat> and the most recent writing in the area of, of, of caste politics, where these, these writings are also about these different new kind of movements are happening in, in Indian context. So these are three important writings, I would say, which would uh, explain that what are these new groupings, uh, what are these new formations of uh, resistance. And now uh, talking about my work where I took a lot of uh, inspiration from this guy, uh, from this professor, this scholar Myron uh, Wiener, he wrote a book in Son, uh, called Sons of the Soil and he used this concept understanding three major movements in India which are basically movements for the uh, regional autonomy because I am dealing with an autonomy movement for, for separate statehood and he talks about these three one is in the emergence of Shiv Sena in Mumbai, in Bombay and uh, another is Telangana movement in Andhra Pradesh and also the another state called Assam where there is lots of resistance uh, by the students. So these are actually where students play an important role. And then these uh, questions of identity were raised in, in different other parts of India. And these are another pioneer work where uh, questions of identity has been dealt in such a way where which actually kind of uh, um, sets a new path from Marxist tradition to, to a new uh, social movements tradition. <coughs> And then uh, Professor T.K. Uman, he is another uh, kind of pioneer scholar who uh, is talking about linking the issues of regional identity with the issues of nationalism. And I think uh, his, he has inspired a generation of uh, social movement scholars in India. Uh, and when I talk about my uh, move, uh, study on Telangana movement. At the same time, these three movements cannot be ignored. And these actually are Charkhan movement. These are again three autonomous uh, movement for state autonomies. And they, they actually were successful movements. And why I'm mentioning that here? Because these three movements have actually revived that demand which has been going on for the past 50 years. So these three states were formed in the year 2000. And after that, again, this Telangana movement demand was picked up, which was kind of in a uh, in a lull situation before. Now, why Telangana is so important? Why this movement has uh, uh, piqued our interest? Is uh, there are there are several reasons that this area, this region, basically, is uh, uh, one of this Telangana region has been. Uh, it was the only region in India which was never ruled by the British uh, in India. There were many several, but this was the, the important region. And the, that, on, so because of uh, no interference of British rule, there has been a, uh, that's what scholars believe, that they developed a different kind of culture because of uh, their because of no exposure of English language, they remained in their own languages, which was a Urdu language, because it was a ruled by a Muslim king. So, rest of the rest of India was exposed to English language, and they developed a kind of culture which was, you know, uh, part of the colonial culture. And English actually became the medium for them to uh, was to exposed to that culture, and that led to so what happened after when India got freedom. Uh, this region was forcefully merged 
with the other region uh, and then form the Andhra state. And that's where the, the contention started and then uh, people started asking for a separate statehood. I mean, I'm not going in detail of the stories, but just to give you an idea. And since then, uh, late 50s onwards, this demand has been going on. And then finally, the state was formed in 2014. So I focused on all these uh, 50 or 60 years to understand how this formation happens and uh, uh, what are the strategies, what are the networks. So these are the, some of the quickly running in a minute, what are the major writings which uh, actually are, which are the basis of my studies. Uh, this is another important book and this is a journalistic account uh, of the movement. Uh, this is a historic account of the movement, uh, Telangana Andhra. And, uh, but what I'm highlighting in all these, if you see, I'm highlighting the cultural, see, the, the way scholars highlighted the cultural disparities, cultural hegemony. And this was the, the first book after the movement when the state was found. I reviewed that book, but although this was not a scholarly work because it was a bunch of collections of, uh, of different newspaper articles. But this was an kind of this can be considered like one first book on the uh, in Telangana movement, and then later on this movement was talking about the that how movement. So this was a global movement, which was also not uh, very uh, well recognized. And this book actually tried to establish that how why there was international invisibility of Telangana movement. And again, you see the politics in emotion. The role of emotions actually. And there was the, these are songs of Telangana. And uh, uh, when movement was going on, there were people from Telangana region, wherever they were settled, like as an immigrant, actually contributed to the movement in, in, their, in their own way. So this is the region which uh, is the uh, uh, southern part of India. And uh, uh, in the second picture, you see this Telangana and the other region, Andhra and Royal Sima. So Telangana is the region which wanted to get separate statehood. So this was my field site, major field site. Uh, this is uh, the arts college, which is the hub of Telangana activists. It's called the hotbed, or you know, the of, of Telangana activists. So I was entering in this space every day, and I have. So that's where I did my ethnography. And the places surrounding by this are the hostel area and other uh, schools. But because why this is only this particular building, because it was. Art, social arts and social science colleges and uh, it is uh, uh, when I collected my data so I found that almost 95% students in this college belongs to the lower caste which is you know what you call this SCST you know, OBCs. so <coughs> largely the movement is led by this college so majority of the leadership in Telangana student politics was by the Dalit students uh, and OBC students <coughs> This is a magnificent building built in 1919 by a Muslim ruler. And uh, I really want to highlight that this person, this <coughs> Nizam, had such a great vision that in uh, 1940s, 50s, during that period, in fact 30s onwards, he was the first person in India who tried to translate the entire science education into Urdu and he hired scholars from different parts of the world and this has been a very prestigious university until until late 60s, 70s and I, I was told that there were many cases where people who studied in the US wanted to go back to teach in this university but then gradually there was a downfall and now this is kind of any other uh, state university where there is no academic rigor, there is just kind of, you know, that's what the state of education nowadays in the neoliberal times. And uh, even when, well, while I was doing my field work, I realized that a lot of self finances uh, courses were introduced and uh, there was hardly any scholarship given to students. So this was the state of So, but this, the contribution of this building is that it has produced hundreds and hundreds of activists who made this movement a mass movement. So the movement campus from the start, the movement campus from the start, uh, started from the campuses and went to the masses, and this was the the the, the way it took place. I tried to explore that, and 
while I was doing that was the, the peak time of the movement. So this is the scene, like that's how every month there was a huge rally. And then of course subsequently there were a lot of marches which were taking place. Uh, so when you study about this movement, these are the key words you will, you will see as a history of movement. Like the safeguards were actually when the state was formed and there were resentment, there were actually, uh, um, the, there was discussion about that why this region who remained backward actually never given any weightage. So there were some safeguards given to them officially, but they were never actually uh, given in reality. So there was this whole mismatch and that's what I also tried to collect some data on like why safeguards or safeguard means like what uh, uh, special fund for, 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 the, for this region and uh, eventually this was ne this never happened and these that's why they call it uh, there are many articles written on this issue that how uh, the government betrayed this area of people and <coughs> After a lot of struggle, or uh, because the region remained backward, when finally the, the people of this region got education, the first generation who came into higher education, one of the intellectuals, he actually drew this image and which shows the history of discrimination, history of betrayal, that how all the resources were taken by the people of the other region, who was the dominant region. So this is shown the, the region of Telangana who remained economically backward. Now this, this is one of the argument which actually uh, before me, every, all the scholars were highlighting uh, Telangana as a region which is economically backward. That was the argument. So my take on it, this is what in my thesis is that uh, you know, economic or political uh, reasons or, or the uh, problems are the manifestation of the cultural. And when you understand the history of this region, the cultural, the cultural, re, the cultural notion which has been ignored by the scholar, I think that is where I uh, took off and uh, uh, highlighted or emphasized on the cultural aspect. And uh, 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 while studying and understanding the the uh, internal politics of the movement, then I got to know that you cannot do politics without understanding the, the cultural aspects of the region. And that's what I will highlight, that how this cultural assertion was taking place in all these years. But it took a longer time for people of that region to understand their own culture or their own cultural deprivation. Uh, it, as I said, that you know, higher education, that's again, here university space becomes an important site because when first generation finally reached to the higher education in 80s or 90s, then this whole literature was started producing and uh, you know, these, uh, some of these uh, quotes I wanted to write here. So now, because as I said, that culturally they remain backward and again, then culture means language as well. So there was a discrimination on the basis of accent because the, both the region they speak the same language but the accent was different and that also became a kind of basis of uh, and there were you know uh, the people I met the young generation even the, the, the engineers I met then Hyderabad becoming a cyber hub you know there were lots of jobs in 2000 onwards especially late 90s and this whole generation of Osmania students were actually just sitting idle with their degrees, there is nobody there to hire them. And that is because they belong to a certain region. And why? Because the, the, all the industries, media, and uh, the uh, politics or this economy is basically controlled by the other region. And that's the, 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 the data which I try to highlight. Now, over a period of time, and movement was going on, you see the, the kind of anger uh, they developed uh, against the region. It wasn't uh, there before, like until 2005. Uh, while I was there, I was participating in some of the events because when they realized that if they were betrayed again and again over in this last 60 years, so then they realized that there is no other way except resistance and just now this is like last and final. And this is where actually uh, the finally government had to bend down and it finally declared that Telangana is going to form. <coughs> 
from social movement perspective, I think this is one of the important, looks very simple, called joint action committee, but this is one of the important uh, concepts which students have developed in, developed by the Osmani University called Joint Action Committee. So the committee, this this is uh, an instrument basically to democratize the movement. Now, so many like hundreds and thousands of formation of uh, different uh, dif different communities, different uh, social groupings uh, were taking place, and they were all actually inspired by the students. So when Osmania University Joint Action Committee was formed, it it actually uh, inspired all the social categories. Now, can you believe that? Uh, the this went down to every social category in the state. Even the pan wallas started their own jacks. Rickshaw wallas started their own jacks. You know, uh, there were labor unions jacks. There were IT jacks. People were working in the IT sector. There were. Jets. I mean, there's a whole list. They're like you know, I kept collecting, and there is no end. There were jacks in the in in villages in small cities, in small towns, and even then cost-wise. Now there are thousands of cats, so thousands of jack. So wherever I go in any village, some of the villages I visited, they have their, every sub caste they have their own jacks. So this shows that this movement has, why, how, that's, that's the process that how a movement becomes a mass movement. So it did not remain limited to campus. And again, you know, this is the contribution of the university. And university, people are looking at it as, an, and as a very ideal space. Uh, then, uh, I would say this movement is the confluence of different identities and ideologies. And these are just some of the, you can say, like 1% of the organization I'm mentioning. There were hundreds of students' organizations. Every university in the states were forming their own organization in the name of Telangana. Uh, and these are some of the caste-based organizations, which were, you can say, because they were based in Hyderabad in Osmani University, that's why they were the more popular, most popular uh, student organization. And you, you see, I mentioned in that, in below, by some people. So there were individual, yeah, so I, uh, when I was meeting people, they were handing over me their business card. And uh, on business card, there was always written, Jai Telangana, Jai Jai Telangana, and then, there were every person was some either the president of some union or the secretary of some union. So there were like I didn't see a someone who was having just the activist. Everyone was kind of taking a lead, you know, leadership role. So that's what this movement has done. That everyone feel, was feeling that this is my movement. I don't have to follow anybody. I can do on my own. <coughs> and uh, uh, while I was writing this thesis. My, my thesis, I was also influenced by the writings of Franz Fanon, and this is one of the quote I wanted to highlight because, um, uh, and it is interesting that how when uh, uh, there was, I can say there was endless discussion in the university space about this whole uh, debate on <coughs> settlers versus native. That is what Franz Fanon's debate is. And, uh, uh, this chief minister, Olenki Ramura, who was a former chief minister in the 80s, what he did to, uh, to kind of basically, uh, um, as a kind of, uh, during his time, his politics, he basically never ever mentioned the word Telangana. He did a lot of welfare work during his time, but he focused on the Telugu unity. Telugu is the language. And, uh, then he has to face backlash. Even that time, the movement was actually taking shape, and people said, "This Telugu unity is myth. We don't believe in your, in your, uh, in your Telugu Thalli, which is mother of Telugu." So this is the 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 image of the state in official symbol of Telangana, mother, uh, mother Telangana. To oppose this, to oppose this, they brought their own Telangana Thalli. Said, "Our mother does not look like that." This is the image of our mother. And so these are the local, what you call the, that's how you assert the, the, the local organic identities started taking shape. And her statues was, was actually, was, here, was installed in, in different districts. At the same time, people started digging history. There were people writing about their own history. And uh, that's why this is one of my claim that the amount of literature this movement has produced none of the movement has ever produced. But because this is written in a local language, Telugu, nobody ever highlighted. 
I mean, I met people who students of our age who wrote 80 books for the movement. I met a person who took an, took an oath. He said, I will write a book a month until the is fall. And he wrote almost 120 books. So this is the passion he shows that then and that how emotions play a big role. And there is no ideology. There is no, you know, what we talk here about all in the name of Marxism and all in socialism and all. People have no idea what they don't even understand this, what is it. But at the same time I must say that movement was influenced in the beginning phase by these larger ideologies of Maoism, Marxism, Leninism. And, and that is also one of the reasons that movement took a radical turn. But if you see the history, when 69 movement, when the first agitation was happened, students actually may form their own party and realized after one year long agitation on uh, and fighting with the police or protesting with the police, they lost almost 1,000 students. And I met those students, those, those, that generation who is now in their 17th. They said, we lost our friends, and, and after one year of struggle, then we were just, we were, we were fed up by doing protesting. And then, finally, we formed our own party called Telangana Protest Committee. And this is also very historic. Nobody actually even ever highlighted this, this aspect, that when this party was formed, they fought a parliamentary election, and they won 11 seats out of 14. So they thought students follow the democratic way. They thought now this is their time, the state is theirs. But overnight, the leadership of the movement sold themselves to the, the, the Indian government, to the uh, Indian government, and they merged their small party with the. So as a result, what happened? That that generation of activists who lost their friends have turned into the they opted the path of radicalism. And they were the one who went to the forest, uh, became next slide, Maoist, Leninist, or whatever you call them in, in that time. This is the way actually the movement shifted from 70s onwards, from campus to the forest. And this is one angle of the movement which actually I tried to write. And then, while I was studying, the, so again now, how online media because in 2010 onwards people everyone has facebook account and people were doing all kind of online activism at the same time so now you had this is an interesting you know con contrary to the, the the present movements uh, you know these online movements they were struggle at the ground and at the same time people were highlighting on the, the social media sites and I, I, I interviewed all these students who actually were uh, very active in doing all these things. And every activist of this movement was facing the, the police cases and such a repression by the state that every, almost like there were, there were 20 major activists who were facing more than 150 cases on, in, on each of them. So every day they were, or every week, they were going to the court uh, and, you know, for their cases. In other words, this also kind of forced them, them to be part of the movement. They, did, they could not get out of it. And even actually many of them, even after formation of state, they are still going to the court. So they could not get out of it and state somehow in a way played a very negative role. That how uh, putting them in a, through a, you know, their life is at stake. Now many of them are married, having kids, majority of them actually. Out of these hundred students I interviewed, majority of them were married and having kids, but they had to face these police charges every week going back and forth to the court. And uh, one of the reasons that the movement could not get a national uh, uh, face or the popularity at national level because the entire media until 2010 was owned by the other state people. And in 2010, uh, movement also started their own channel, which was a uh, part by the political party, and that gave a lot of visibility in that area and also at national level. And, and also because movement became worldwide by then, there were uh, people, this popular figure like Gadar and all, they were all coming here, meeting people and, you know, uh, mobilizing globally. Fundings were going to the activists. So it, it kind of helped them channelizing their own resources. 
So in other words, what this movement was, it was basically the andrization of Telangana. So this is again going back to native versus settlers debate that you know people said no this is now our spirit, this is my land, you know, this is where you know we belong and and uh, I, I saw that transformation was almost there. You know, in, uh, in Hyderabad, there was a lot of this called Andhra Tiffin. And in 2013, they were all actually shutting down because this whole kind of food place and everything was basically, the culture was this whole, what you call the hegemonic culture or the mainstream culture was the culture of the other region, which was actually there in their space. And they actually started taking off their business. So a lot of, and no, a lot of, uh, there was no new investment because of the, the state was in, in that uh, process. So many scholars highlighted that this, this is the cultural renaissance of Telangana, and that's what I try to highlight. And you see now cultural renaissance happen. They stopped by, they stopped watching their movies. They, there were cases where many times the the uh, cinema halls were vandalized by the activists and many places wherever they see that Andhra on they, did that happen that you know when the link you know this kind of old rowdyism also became part of the movement. And uh, now <coughs> why I wanted to show you this picture you know you see the the number of organizations that's how when one program was organized all these student or these are all student organizations and uh, so the end number of organizations and when I was participating in that in that event so there were all leaders sitting. So this program will start in the morning, will go by evening because everyone has to you know, speak and everyone is leader. So that's how the movement was going. And uh, uh, another interesting aspect of this movement that this did not, it was just not merely for Telangana. And why I'm highlighting this one here because this is the kind of, within the movement there were many ideological struggles were going on and that because as I said in the beginning that this movement was largely led by the lower caste students and that's why these identity assertion of the, the or Ambedkar became a central figure of the movement. I think I've never seen someone mentioning this article 2 of the constitution and it was dozens of seminar where they were they generally don't read Ambedkar but when they but they knew that article, what Ambedkar said about the formation of the smaller state, you know, so this is this shows that how people uh, knew uh, about the the legal aspect or the official aspect of the how the state is formed. Again, and also because Ambedkar got a special status there, and because Ambedkar was given the honorary degree in in 1950s by the Usman University. And here, that's why the slogan Jaihim Jaihim So Jaihim became a popular slogan of the movement at the same time. And uh, let's talk about the strategies and network quickly. And so another interesting aspect of the movement is that in 1969, as we mentioned, so these were the these these were the uh, the uh, activists of that time. They were actually organizing under a forum called the 1969 Movement Founders Forum. They made a forum and they said, let's, not, let's guide this new generation. Let's, let's not repeat the same mistake which we have done. So guide them and, uh, you know, and that's how the strategies were defined. Uh, I attended many of these meetings and where this was a good combination of young and old generation and sharing their experiences. They, they said, in our time there was no media. But now you have social media, you have mainstream media. So, you know, focus on that. And this is the, so a lot of this instruction. And uh, I think I mentioned in my book all these strategies when they were protesting in '69 without any without any planning, without any proper management. They were just going out in the road, and many people were killed. But here they kind of saved that time and that and, and kind of devised new strategies for the next generation. And uh, because, as I said, there were hundreds of organizations, so there was a competition who will protest first, you know. So when, so every student organization, they have a TV in their, uh, in their hostel room, and one person's duty was just to watch TV all day, watch news, anything happened in Delhi, they have to protest here. So because 
uh, of course, the people, the, the organization which are a little wealthy, they have more resources. So, in, so this uh, upstairs, you said this is a ready-made effigy, and they have to just tag someone's name. So they have immediately run to the protest site and do it. So these are these kind of different strategies they were using. <laughs> and uh, I think in uh, Indian student movement, this is uh, uh, an interesting aspect that how students were leading a state-wide uh, walking protest called Padiyatras. And when they started doing this, they got a lot of respect from the masses, which never ever, uh, kind of, politician could never ever get that. And that changed the whole scenario of the, the, the direction of the movement. <coughs> and this movement is the confluence of ideologies. Now, these are the four different concepts which were developed in the movement or by the by different scholars. Now, one, one section was fighting only for geographic Telangana. They said, we don't want any ideology. We only are want to focus on the, the state. We want a geographic location. And, that's, and then there were all these formation of state social justice Telangana. And then, of course, there is Delhi going. And so there's a popular, uh, popular scholar, Professor Panchayariya, who who, who came up with this idea of Dalit Boj in Telangana and that also in a way kind of very similar to social justice Telangana. So these are these uh, different ideologies which were taking place and uh, kind of gave a new direction of in, in, in post-2000 Telangana. <coughs> and as I said that how different ideologies were taking shape and this guy kind of uh, became a prominent figure of the movement. And at the same time, he had his own reservation. He, he, he was disassociated for a while because there was a lot of backlash. People were so radical. They said, what well, about this Dalit Bhojan? We want this Telangana. So these were all like an all going back and forth, these debates. But this uh, channelized this whole, imagine this um, kind of, he was also kind of a, a, a supporter of English language. And now the Telangana, the Sosmania University where I study, which I studied, is actually most of the people are, are they deal with the vernacular, the local language. And now teaching them this or you know, uh, kind of guiding them that you have to learn English. He said without English there is no emancipation. He said, what will you do even you, if you get Telangana state? There will be no jobs because you don't know English. So you have to learn English. So the, all these kind of different uh, uh, ideologies were taking shape. And at the same time, then this beef festival organized within. So these are all Telangana activists who were doing it. So, and uh, this guy who was standing, I'll show you later. This guy standing in the middle, he formed this beam drum. And uh, through that, he uh, wrote a beef anthem. And we are actually. Uh, this is, and these are all Telangana activists who were uh, doing their different kind of cultural assertion, uh, part of different assertion. And that's why this drum is, it became the kind of heartbeat of Telangana. This was used as a symbol of cultural assertion uh, in the movement. There were many students who starting, who starting adding their surname as Dapu. Dapu is this drum. And uh, uh, many students who started writing their name as Telangana. I was even witnessing when the state was formed in 2014, but when I was doing my field work in 2012, I saw many uh, motorbikes where people had already changed the license plate into TN, like it's Telangana, from Andhra to Telangana. So this, this shows that how assertion was taken on a different pace, what even government was not even imagining. <coughs> and at the same time, uh, in the this is the, the neighboring university, which was called English and Foreign Language University, which played an important role, which I mentioned in my book, because there were a lot of repression from the state in that university space of Osmania. So whenever there was a police raid, so this university was providing shelter to the activist of that university. So this also created a, a kind of played an important role. A, I would say a kind of the, the most important role after Osmania, who, who was actively involved in Telangana struggle. And as I said earlier, that how uh, these were different versions which was uh, at the same time going on, where Ambedkar, who became a father figure of the movement, also uh, interpreted interpreted in a, in a different way. Ambedkar was uh, being experimented by leftist 
by the Marxist or socialist and uh, within the, the local communities. Here, Ambedkar is presented as a Moses and they wrote the whole history of that how Ambedkar is, was a movie, is similar to Moses. And then other uh, forms of even like you know, challenging the Hindu hegemony on campuses where this magazine actually played, played an important role by even in the Andhra region where uh, this whole uh, historic mythical character like Ar Krishna and all, they were also redefined by the uh, so overall, what was the uh, thing that people, there were scholars writing about that the feeling of the time has come when people should belong first to Telangana and then to their parents. Now this is a very powerful statement, I'd say, that uh, you know, scholars were even highlighting because uh, of the backlash by the, by the state. So I coined a term here uh, called a ticketivist because uh, uh, why, so the interesting thing about this work is that uh, when I finished my field work and I was analyzing this data and in the meantime the state was formed. So I had to go back and kind of collect the, the other you know, post-formation story. And when this election was announced, first state election, now I see these people who used to claim themselves Marxist or Ambedkarites and or you know, Leninite, everyone was rushing to different parties. They will go to any party who will provide them the election ticket. You know, so there, there were all these exchange of, and uh, I think after that, except uh, I think a little section of a small section of activists, majority of them, they changed their own what the so-called ideology they were belonging to, and it all become power or power structure. So that's why it this. So it became 29th state on June 2nd, 2014. So this is let's just sum it to sum it up that. This is the culmination of several identity, this movement, and uh, uh, we forgot to mention about you know uh, about the gender issue, uh, which actually because this movement also has a kind of within that there is a feminist movement going on, and within uh, that there is a Dalit feminism was taking place. So these were all all kind of uh, internal mechanism of the movement, which all helped to understand movement from movement from a different uh, angle, and. There were a lot of these uh, uh, people who, who actually became part of the Next Life movement, came out, and then also uh, started their own uh, forum to help the Dalana activists. And uh, so I use this term called internal colonization. colonization. Uh, this is the term, this is not my term, this is the term which was used by the first state reorganization commission. And uh, this move, this term, uh, when commission used and explained, he said, if if this region, directing to the Indian state in 1952, they said, if you if you merge this region with Andhra region, this region will remain a merely a colony for the Andhra, and actually government ignored that fact, and that's what exactly happened over a period of time, and that's why you know you see a backlash from the the activist and. Uh, and that's why this, uh, uh, you know, the whole issues of sons of the soil and native versus uh, settlers debate, it actually more, in a way, charged up during 70s. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned, that highest number of, uh, large number of literature, highest number of suicide in the making of statehood, and uh, um, the core argument is that more than the economic factor, it is a cultural factor that wrote in the background and that is why these language, festival, dialect, food, and films, they are, or, and they, or the religious symbols or local symbols became the part, they became contentious in this whole process. And this is the kind of challenging the, the Andhra hegemony, or you say the mainstream, the existing hegemony, through these cultural symbols. And that is why I would say the cultural analysis, analysis which was missing in the social movements scholarship in India was actually, uh, in, in that sense, Telangana movement provides a, a good case study to understand that how culture takes shape. And on uh, that note, I think I'll uh, we'll have some questions. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much.
much, Gaurav. I think it's all on the order that we had on the, the discussions. Uh, thank you so much. It was really, you know, a kind of work that actually has never been ever done before. So this is a major contribution that you've made. There's so much you've given us we need to talk about <coughs> and discuss. But still, perhaps we could open with some thoughts and comments and like Bumsky and I for the last, and we will have time for your, as well, for your comments and questions. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Guara, for uh, this and the work you have done. Um, you didn't have time to go into it now, but the book is also looking at uh, student politics in uh, some other universities. Um, so I see this very much as uh, a book that is highlighting the role of universities and students uh, in mobilizing uh, in general, uh, although it's, it's focused on, on Kalanga. And also, the second part, which I think became very clear here, is the role of culture uh, as a site of struggle. Um, so, I want to highlight some things that comes to my mind. Um, just inviting you and us to reflect on. Um, so I, firstly, in general, um, I very much agree with you that um, social movement studies historically has put a lot of focus on class and, and economy. And more recently on culture. Um, and here you are contributing. However, um, isn't the challenge for us to understand how culture plays a role in relationship to class and economy. So the interplay between class economy and culture must be important here, I think. All right, so if that is kind of a broad question, which I'm not expecting you to answer, but maybe reflect upon. Um, I could be a little bit more specific and say that I agree with you that, yes, university is a site of the imaginations, of resistance and identities, counter countercultures, clearly. We have seen that in many countries and in many historical locations, how that has been so vital. But, University is also a site of a class case caused um, education reproduction for serving the state and the capitalist hegemony and maintaining the existing socio-economic order. So I would like to hear more from you uh, when it comes to um, how that privileged space um, is in an ambivalence, right? And trying to negotiate that. Um, all right. So secondly, I am also thinking that I would like to hear more when it comes to the fact that Telanga is, is a place uh, also of the uh, Muslim identity, uh, which is pr very important today in India when we have a very aggressive Hindu nationalist um, government. Um, and what role did that alliance play? Um, you were mentioning a lot of cross-identity collaboration in this mobilization. But the role of Muslims, please, if you could say something more about that. And then, um, I'm also curious when it comes to this never-ending dilemma in resistance. So resistance movements eventually, after a long struggle, in this case, after some 60 plus years, succeed and they create a statehood. All right. But what happens then, after post-2014? When I was in Hyderabad, um, I noticed a lot of frustration among activists when it comes to um, the corruption, uh, repression, 
happening from the new government there? So what is the role of universities and student politics in a free, in a formal sense, in a free uh, Telangana? Um, how do you see that shift? I think that, I, I'm more, but, but maybe that could be uh, like a, a beginning. But this is coming from my inspiration of, of your work. I hope you understand that. So it's, it's just how my brain gets provoked and, and interested to engage in the topics. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Should I go next? Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, uh, you know, I really enjoyed reading the book. Uh, uh, I knew broadly the content of the book, but I read it recently. And uh, I think uh, it, it's a great contribution uh, both to uh, an understanding of the Telangana movement, uh, but also to uh, you know the whole understanding of what universities can do, uh, you know, as uh, sites of resistance. Uh, and it's also very inspirational in that sense. Uh, for me, it was also. Deja vu in many ways. I was teaching in Hyderabad when all of this happened. And uh, I uh, know almost every incident that you have narrated here. And I was following every incident. Uh, but in a very, in a different university, you know, University of Hyderabad, uh, which didn't have uh, the same kind of you know, vibrant, uh, separate kind of movement. Uh, but we were following what was going on in Osmania. So, you know, it was like, you know, going back to those times in many ways. So I enjoyed that very much. Uh, I think the, uh, you know, the strongest point uh, that came through for me in your book is, uh, you know, when you think of university as a site, uh, and this, this is a point that Stellan is also making, uh, the site is embedded in a larger society. Right? So there is a dialectical relationship between the site and the rest of society. Right? In some cases, the site may simply reflect uh, you know, what is going on in the larger society. In some cases, the site may actually create uh, you know, a vanguardist kind of uh, you know, movement uh, that could change the entire society. So, you know, so what you have shown, and I think it's right, you know, I, I totally agree with that, that Usmania was vanguardist, right, uh, as far as the Telangana movement was concerned. And when the political players fell behind or were ready to compromise, the university as a site emerged to the forefront and then forced the political leaders, uh, you know, to follow suit and, you know, take part in the movement. And uh, this is, you know, when you describe KCR, you know, this uh, Chandrasekhar Rao, who is the now Chief Minister of Telangana, uh, when he goes on a fast and then, you know, without consulting the movement, he ends his fast. Uh, you know, the students do a shavaya, you know, they take out his corpse and burn his effigy. Uh, and he is forced to come back to the movement and, you know, uh, restart, right? So, and it's that uh, very eventful week that ends in the announcement of the uh, December 9th, 2009. We were watching all the events closely. Uh, I think the greatest contribution of the book is the ethnography that you have done, right, uh, inside the university of uh, the student leaders, you know, of the uh, kind of networking that is that they do, you know, the kinds of uh, political processes that emerge, you know, in dhabas, you know, in these coffee tea houses, you know, uh, and uh, the intermeshing that uh, the student leaders have with the uh, you know, political leaders, the political spaces beyond the university. I think that's a real contribution. I really enjoyed the chapter. You know, that, uh, I think that's, uh, uh, it, it was also, uh, you know, something that uh, I didn't know uh, a great detail of, so you know, I really learned you know, from that process. Uh, but to, uh, you know, go on, uh, you know, the path of raising some questions like Stephen, and I uh, have some overlap with what he said. Uh, the first point that I want to make is, uh, you know, there are uh, three different political movements that were either incubated at the uh, Usmania University or, you know, where Usmania students uh, took part very actively, right, in the Telangana context. So one is, you know, you start with 1969, 
but if you go back 20 years and you talk about it in your book, uh, it's the Telangana arm struggle, right? Uh, which is uh, uh, a, a, a very popular struggle against the Muslim ruler uh, and uh, you know Nizam. You know you talk about him in a somewhat appreciative tone. Nizam was the villain, right, for this movement, and you know millions of peasants were actually up in arm, arms against the Nizam, and they were trying to overthrow the Nizam. So it was a very popular uh, uh, revolt against the Nizam. And Usmania students were very much part of it. Right? So, and there were also, uh, at that time, there was no NRS, you know, the Ambedkar hostel that you talk about. Mm -hmm. But there was Reddy hostel, you know, there were caste hostels at that time, mm -hmm. which played a very important role, uh, even in mobilizing students who took part in the Telangana arms struggle. And Telangana arms struggle was the second largest peasant rebellion uh, in Asia, right, after the Chinese Revolution. So it was a very big event. So that, you know, so, so that was one movement, the communist movement, which then resurfaces uh, after the Naxalite movement, uh, you know, uh, starts in Bengal, moves to northern coastal Andhra, becomes the Srikakura movement, and then it, uh, you know, re-emerges in Telangana, right? So, so, and that continues, you know, the, the communist tradition, the communist movements continue uh, until very recently. In fact, uh, the decline begins in the late 80s. Uh, uh, mainly not that you know the movement abandoned uh, the people, the state repressed the movement. And this is a very very well studied fact. Post 1985, uh, you know the Maoist movement was brutally repressed by the state by Indi and others. Yeah. The second movement is of course the regional movement that you are talking about, which has two moments, 1969. And uh, you know, uh, 90s again it starts, uh, and then you know it goes on. The the so this is I mean basically you've studied the regional, uh, and and uh, there are some very very interesting questions. You know what led to the regional movement in the 60s? Uh, the, uh, the factors that led to the regional movement in the 90s probably are very different. So I'll talk about it briefly, uh, and then you know uh, and and. Uh, the, the calm between 1975 and the 90s is also something that needs to be explained, right? So, uh, I mean, your explanation is that, you know, once Telangana is uh, uh, sold out, you know, the, the idea is sold out, I mean, the leaders are sellouts, basically, by the early 70s, people like Chenna uh, and then, you know, people move to next slide. I don't think it's, you know, it's that simple. I think it's a very complicated story. And I'll point to one or two things. Uh, the third movement is, of course, caste movements, right, which become ascendant after 1980s. And Usmania University for the Telangana region, you know, played a very important role. And you talk about that somewhat, right? And, and the interesting thing is, the second uh, regional, uh, you know, emergence of the regional movement brings together all these different movements, right? And then, you know, it, it becomes the separate Telangana Right? So there's, there's a coalescing of you know, multiple movements into one movement, which also makes it uh, you know, very complex. You know, the second movement is extremely complex. Mm -hmm. And I think we are seeing the impact effects of that already, mm -hmm. once the separate state has formed. That's the, you know, uh, uh, so I just want to say, you know, that there are three different movements. And I think, you know, you need to look at different movements of these movements carefully. Uh, and locate the regional movement. You know, as part of you know this uh, constellation of movements. Uh, the third point uh, that I want to make is again this goes back to what Stellan was saying: cultural versus economic issues. And I think you know every uh, you know uh, any social movement has all these different dimensions. It has economic dimensions, it has political dimensions, it has cultural dimensions. So you know, and they determine one another. So if somebody is reductionist or essentialist and says only the economic is important, we should criticize that. There's no question about it. But you know, uh, the taking the opposite side, saying that uh, you know, culture is more important than the economic, is equally indefensible in my opinion. I think you know it's the interaction of the economic, political, and cultural you know that really produce a movement. And you know, uh, the way I read your book is you know you focused on the cultural dimensions of the movement. 
you know, cultural uh, expression of the movement and cultural factors that led to, you know, the sentiment of separate Telangana kind of situation. Uh, the reason why this is very important is, you know, if you if you introduce the economic, then you know you will understand why the 60s emergence of separate Telangana is very different from the 90s emergence. So before the late 60s, there were issues of irrigation, unequal irrigation between the regions, as you rightly point out. Uh, there was inequality of employment, right? There is uh, inequality of you know resource uh, allocation of various kinds. Uh, so largely economic issues, right? Were at the uh, at the heart of. Of course, there were also cultural issues. So there. So it's a combination of these two things that led to the first moment. In fact, if we go back and read a lot of accounts of the 60s, you see both. You know, there's, a, there's the pride of the Telangana people, but also you know the economic issues that get neglected. I think you know uh, to say one is more important than another uh, is uh, I think problematic. What happens post 70s is you know starting in the late 70s, 1976, 77, uh, the uh, agricultural sector in Telangana starts growing rapidly. It takes off. I mean, in fact, that's the subject of my PhD, mm -hmm. right? So Telangana starts growing very rapidly, starting in the 1970s. Agriculture takes off. In fact, by 1980s, uh, there is a lot of mobility in agriculture in Telangana. You know, people are actually witnessing, you know, uh, gains. So that is the moment. You know, the movement goes into the background because people are actually benefiting from whatever model exists. And then N.T. Ramarao comes and, you know, breaks down the old traditional structures and he creates something called wonders, you know, which are uh, administrative units at a, uh, at a, on a plane that is lower than the district level and higher than the village level. So when he creates that, there's also a lot of political upward mobility that people can uh, experience during that period. That is the reason, you know, it goes into a, a calming kind of, you know, phase. And then, you know, you actually see, uh, you know, also simultaneously the next slide, the resistance actually uh, in the region goes into the Naxal stuff. It's that combination, you know, which goes into the 90s, Naxal movement is repressed, and uh, because now Telangana is growing rapidly, they need more resources, they need more irrigation. And uh, so earlier there was, you know, because it was backward, people fought. Now because they're growing, they fight. Because they are achieving mobility, they find. You know, we want more resources in order for the growth to continue. This is also a point that Colin Brown makes. It's very interesting. You know, he makes this point in many public speeches. In the 80s and early 90s, Salaman actually witnessed uh, the you know, improvements. So, and then, you know, you begin to see by the mid to late 90s, uh, agricultural growth begins to slow down. When the movement, uh, you know, starts becoming popular again. Right, and uh, the decade of, so that's the decade when Telangana witnesses a spate of farmer suicide. And that coincides with the re-emergence of the movement and you know, it, it begins to take off. And many of the Usmania students come from rural areas. They've seen, you know, agrarian distress, right, that comes from this rural context and then they begin to, uh, you know, uh, express their own uh, sort of, you know, uh, dissent, you know, even through the so, uh, I, mean, I think, you know, the economic issues, uh, you know, need to be combined with cultural issues mm -hmm. in order to understand the different moments, you know, of this particular movement uh, and also, you know, to think of, uh, uh, you know, how uh, the material and the cultural, you know, are not really separate entities, you know, and we don't need to privilege one over the other, but both are important. And the last point is, you know, again, going back to Stellan's uh, uh, you know, how he ended, uh, you know, the, uh, the, so what's the future of Usmania University at the site of, uh, you know, resistance? Because it seems to me, apart from the corruption and all these things, you know, the leadership has been co-opted into the, into the state, mm -hmm. right? And the leadership has been bought off, you know, very significantly. Uh, so what happens to the university? You also say that, you know, the university is breaking down, right? there's no academic rigor. So is this the, does it spell the end of, you know, uh, so is it a dark end, right, uh, to a very exciting phase of, let's say, almost 100 years of resistance uh, in this university? Uh, or, you know, do you actually see from your own ethnography and uh, 
uh, what you observe, can you see, you know, uh, interesting possible new developments, you know, coming out of uh, you know, Spania University. But the key point is, you know, uh, the, 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 this is the last point. I think. The key point is, you know, there is a, uh, a, a logic of social mobility that becomes part of, uh, you know, a lot of element of people in the 80s and 90s when they're achieving growth. Uh, and so the movement itself, you know, the dominant part of the movement becomes the logic of social mobility. Right? So, uh, so what happens is, you know, that particular logic is manifested in the new leadership of, you know, Chandrasekhar Rao and others. And then, you know, the various kinds of other movements like Dalit movement or communist movement, you know, those actually have been repressed already, right, in Telangana. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, once the state forms, you know, it splits, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the movement splits and, you know, there's a progressive group uh, that uh, becomes, uh, that wants to resist now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as long as, you know, the dominant group is able to promise and deliver some social mobility, mm -hmm. Telangana itself will be captured in the logic of social mobility, right? So, and where does the university stand, right? So we could, we could definitely see Usmania as a great example of a site of resistance. And, you know, universities like UMass could learn from that example. Uh, and, you know, we could, uh, we could actually think of, you know, student movements getting incubated here. You know, people in this room definitely uh, have been part of, you know, various uh, movements here. And, you know, I'm sure they'll go and join larger movements. So, so there is an inspirational case. But, you know, uh, concretely, you know, is this mm -hmm. the end of Usman? Thank you. Thank you, Lopsi. Um, so you can see it's going to be, your book is uh, going to inspire a lot of rich discussion and rich sort of thinking. Um, so you've provided, you, you've really done something that is, um, you, I think, a very significant, magnificent contribution. And somebody, as somebody from, you know, who's really, you know, uh, my work is in the field of education. For me, this is you know, so wonderful to see an example of work, research like this. Because it's very, very rare and exceptional to really find ethnographic research in education, in higher ed, um, you know, in particular. And certainly not sort of in India, you really, you know, you're not going to find work like this. And so yours is really one of the seminal contributions. I think it's going to be something that's going to be you know, read you know, down the generations and it's going to be having a you know, significant impact really and, and generating and stimulating more sort of research and writing on this. So so first I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. And I remember sort of you know um, getting to know you when you had just sort of actually done your research and you submitted your thesis, etc. And I said, you know, here, you know, he's from the north of India, and he's doing this work in, you know, in um, in Hyderabad, and you know, sort of trying to negotiate sort of actually a new culture, a new language, all of that. And um, you know, so, so for me, it was really marvelous that you actually took on this, um, you know, you took on this endeavor, and it's something that really needed to be done, right? Because I mean, I was in Hyderabad also at the same time on my sabbatical. And I was actually looking at sort of education and neoliberalism and the privatization of education more and higher ed. And I was definitely also following and being part of some of you know, these events and the beef eating festival. And, you know, and it, it's something that's so complex to really make sense of. You know? It's really sort of befuddling and saying, OK, how are these young people sort of, in a sense, giving up their careers, their lives for something that seems you know, not really tangible, that's going to not you know, offer them any tangible benefits or immediate benefits, certainly. It's about statehood, something that's really, um, you know, sort of a, a larger than life goal and that it's not about sort of something that's going to be, you know, immediate for in terms of a university and the issues that they're facing in the university. They're not struggling around issues that they're facing in the university. So to me, I mean, it's a really fascinating kind of, you know, study to, to undertake and you know I think you've done something that's really again very original and sort of really following sort of the students and the culture of the students activism right so there's there's a there's a culture to the activism itself and and you really try to sort of take that you know show us that 
in the sort of everyday life and in the sort of the tea joint, the dhaba, the gatherings in the hostels, how they're sort of recreating a culture of activism that sort of then, and, and how then they, they take it way beyond the university, right? And then you know, into the entire state and into villages, etc. Um, and, and there's a lot to sort of really unpack and to discuss in, in, your, in your book, and you know, I think Stan and uh, Mamsi have pointed to some really important um, points for, for further conversation. I want to take up like you know a thread from what uh, Bamsi said, but probably from a very different angle, right? Um, that's and in your in the book it's also there. The students' demands finally comes down to water, resources, and employment, right? They said, this is what we really want, right? So in a sense, it's so it's a new social movement, but again, it's very much around a certain kind of class demand, and so you know how does. How does something that's a, a very about, it's actually very material demands around jobs, water, and resources, and through the book also you're talking about how, you know, they are, you know, and it, there's also questionable about whether they're students at all, whether you can even attach the identity of students to them, right? They are in their 40s, a lot of them, they are married, they are, actually, the, the, the university is more like a refuge, a place to sort of park yourself while you are in the transition to you know, get a job, right? It's the cheapest place to live in the city. There's no other place where you can sort of eat, have, get access to subsidized food and you know, a room to sleep, right? So, you know, so the university in a sense, what is the you know, university? The university is, in a sense is the physical space, but it's not really the university in terms of sort of, you know, it's like what's happening in the classroom is not connected at all to what their activism, and that's also a point you, you know, there's lots of interesting things to sort of explore and to discuss further in your book about how is it that, you know, an educational space, the, and the social movement itself is an educational space of its own. That's what you show. That the social movement, the activism itself is a pedagogical space, that it, there's a lot of teaching and learning that's going on all the time, a lot of innovation is going on all the time, and the students are sort of creating it as they are living it, right? So the social movement is an educational space, but very much separate from the educational space that they actually formally occupy, the university, right? And almost in contradiction with formal education. We're right? having almost sort of no relation, almost the formal education is irrelevant. You're only just using the space, really. And even what's happening in the classroom is not in any way connected, and it doesn't seem that the students are any, even attempting to build any connection, like there is, you know, so, so one of my questions was also thinking, like you know, in this country, for instance, you know, the way in which um, student movements uh, in higher education have also influenced sort of the rise of afro am studies, black studies, you know, to emerge, ethnic studies to emerge, gender studies to really sort of establish itself, in, you know, in a really rigorous way. So was you know that kind of direction in this movement, for instance, of sort of saying, like you know, let's establish a Dalit studies. You know, let's have courses or curriculum around this. Like, you know, who can teach? I mean, that seems like that was. There's no sort of. That's not even. Um, um, it's not even something that seems to occur or rise up, even in sort of in a peripheral way. So that to me is very curious. I'm very intrigued by you know how this is so you know um, that that sort of relationship of transforming the university then to actually be relevant to the. Is not a you know is not even something that's a matter on the you know is not an agenda sort of at all right so I, I would love to sort of you know sort of engage more on that and, and have a discussion on that um, because it has then implications as Bamsi pointed out for higher education itself so what happens to higher education is almost like yes the social movement is growing on the side of the university but what and so the Social movement is being sort of actually is evolving in new ways, is becoming richer, impactful, is becoming global, all of that through the sort of student movement. But what is the impact of the social movement on the university? The other way around is something that would be a really good point. And I know that's not some, you know, it's not that the book has to do all of that. What you do in the book is remarkable and very important. But it's a question, you know, it sort of begs the question. 
of what is the impact of the social movement. And what was it? You know, Bamsi is already asking the question, what is going to be? But for me, it was like, what was, what was happening in that context itself over the, those decades? Um, the second thing I want to sort of raise for the discussion is around um, how Hyderabad is known as the Silicon Valley of India, in a sense, right? So there's the Google and the Microsoft and the jobs and the IT sector. And in a sense, is it, you know, these students, quote unquote, have their eyes set on sort of being part of that economy, right? And finding that, no, there's all this gatekeeping and there's all these, you know, obstacles to sort of being able to be part of this new economy where you can experience you know, tremendous social mobility, economic and social mobility, right? Um, in terms of sort of, you know, I mean, this sort of night and day difference, I mean, the difference is so stark in terms of the IT sector and the, you know, the apartments in which the, you know, people who have those jobs live in and the cars they drive, etc. versus, you know, the students in Usmania University and the, you know, their two wheelers that they drive in the rooms they're living in and sharing like, you know, five or six or ten sometimes to a room and, right, and having the, I mean, there's so much stark difference in these two um, worlds, but they're, and they're occupying, and they're in the same city space, right, and so of course for the, these students who are already in their 30s and 40s and, you know, really out wanting to be in the job market, are looking for employment, have families, have kids. Um, for them, it's about accessing that, right? And so, for the other sort of intriguing question was also, you know, how is it that the culture of neoliberalism seems sort of as if it did not, it does not sort of permeate the space? It's almost, you know, here are students who are sacrificing their life, their future, their career. They're also committing suicide in saying we, if we do not get this, you know, I don't see any hope and let my life be sort of, you know, I'll put my life on the line for statehood. And, I'll, and so through committing suicide, through self-immolation, pe more people will be galvanized. You know, it was almost sort of both a sense of hopelessness, but also, a bit, you know, using suicide as a catalyst to sort of actually organ, you know, get more people emotionally sort of drawn in and, you know, to, to be a force in the movement. So here are students sort of, you know, it seems as if completely not performing within the neoliberal culture of sort of individualism, the individual sort of, you know, ambition and try trying to figure out, okay, how do I build my career? But, and so how does, you know, another level, they, they do want access into that economy. That's sort of also the reason for the struggle for statehood, right? And they want that social mobility. So how how does one reconcile these very different, you know, um, cultures that are taking place, and, and that the the student movement seems, in a sense, almost, um, you know, you know, not not just sort of rejecting neoliberalism, but you know, or you know, in some way, a certain kind of. Um, you know, refusal to act in the neoliberal mode. But at the same time, sort of, yes, their, their desire, their demand is for what sort of they see as the neoliberal economy offering them, and that is sort of economics, you know, sort of the kind of mobility and, and um, right, um, you know, success in the new economy. Yeah, so thank you. So thank you so much.